Please welcome Oliver Winnings. Hello. Uh, so my name's Ollie, and I work at a company called Qubit as a product developer. Uh, so today I would like to talk to you about, um, as I'm saying, about how we do Webpack at scale at Qubit. So to start, I'm going to give a very brief, I promise it will be brief, overview of what we do at Qubit to try and explain how Webpack fits in there. So we help our clients deliver highly persuasive personalization at scale to their best customers at the right time. This probably doesn't mean much to you, uh, unless you play like marketing buzzword bingo recently. Um, so I'll try and give a quick explanation with technology. So we collect a lot of data from our clients, and we collect this as a stream of events. This is kind of like product data, uh, transaction data, things like that. Uh, so it's primarily coming from the web as a stream of events. We process this in real time in the cloud, and then we manifest this data as actionable insights that our clients can use. They can define segments of users based on these insights and data, and then create personalizations such as A-B tests, uh, product recommendations, social proofs on top of that. They can then serve these personalizations back to their end users of their website or apps and things, which then generates more data in turn, which gets fed back into the system. So this is how we actually deliver these web assets. So our customer comes in and they're building their personalizations. They're writing them in JavaScript and CSS. This goes into our build pipeline where they can then go and preview those changes in real time to make sure that they're satisfactory. And then the productionized bundle will go off and be uploaded to the CDN and start being served to their end users. This generates the event stream which goes off into our cloud. So the key bit I'm gonna be talking about today is this build pipeline. Every time someone changes a personalization, redefines a segment, we need to completely rebuild their file, which is hosted on our CDN. So when they want a preview, they want to do a production bundle, we're doing a webpack build. And we're doing this thousands and thousands of times a day. And we're going to keep doing it as our company grows. So how do we build this pipeline? So I'm going to start from the very basics. This should probably be quite a familiar uh, webpack setup that you would have running locally. You've got Yarn installing dependencies from the file system onto the file system. Your source code's also there. And then you've got Webpack Development Server monitoring and building that, which is served into the browser. So why doesn't this work for us? Why can we not just take that nice, simple setup that runs locally and just plug it into our entire pipeline? Well, all of our clients are different. They all have different requirements. So they have different personalizations, which means different code that needs to be bundled in. They have different segment definitions. They have different ways of mapping their data to our event stream, for example. Uh, this ultimately means that you need a different webpack configuration for every single client. You can kind of see where this is going, why it doesn't scale. Um, so how do we take this setup and turn it into something that scales? So we're going to start with the file system. So we replaced the input file system of webpack with something called MemoryFS. And most people in this room have probably used MemoryFS without even knowing they're using it. It's actually used as the output file system by Webpack Dev Server, which means it doesn't need to write to disk in between rebuilds. Now, we chose to put it as the input file system so that we can get those same speed benefits without writing to disk. And it also lets us work in container-based environments like Mesos or Kubernetes, because we don't have to run on a pers persistent disk. We then created a Redis package cache that caches frequently used modules, and it means we can stream them straight into MemoryFS without ever touching disk. And then we can also pull all the personalization code and segment definitions from MySQL into MemoryFS as well. So that's kind of uh, addressed the, the input file system and the speed there. But something that, uh, to recap, we need to handle different configurations per client. And Webpack Dev Server does not do this. You start it up with a single config, it just runs with that config. So to deal with that, we replaced Webpack Dev Server with our own wrapper around Webpack, which we call the Dynamic Compiler Service. And it maintains a pool of Webpack instances, one per unique configuration. We then cache the output of every single compilation in Redis, and we key that by a hash of the configuration and code that went into that bundle. So when a repeated request comes in, we can serve it back out very, very fast, which gives our clients a better previewing experience. Now, there's still a bottleneck here. The bottleneck, actually, is Webpack and MemoryFS together. 
Webpack can only do one compilation at a time. You can't start multiple on the same uh, compilation instance. And then MemoryFS, you don't want to start modifying the file system whilst you're doing a compilation, because you'll break that existing one. So we need to scale this system. Right now, we've not really done much that's useful. So this is what we did. We took MemoryFS, we took the compiler service, and we turned them into a worker. One worker is one application instance running on Mesos. This now allows us to scale up and down. We can have one instance, we can have five. And we put that behind a load balancer, and we suddenly have a scaling system. Um, however, this is giving us fixed scaling, which is not really what we want. Our demand is dynamic. During working hours, we have lots of people using our platform. So you know, we want that to, uh, to adjust for their load. And at night time, there's nobody using it. We might as well be running no instances. Additionally, the productionized builds I was talking about, where we need to do things like uglify, minify, run some verification on it, things like that, um, they don't need to be on demand. We don't need to have that kind of extra feature. But what we do need is the ability to push that to the CDN. And we also need them to be very resilient. So to address this, we added a job queue for production builds. This will take those builds, uh, run them on the worker pool, upload them to CDN, and then serve it to the browser. And then we implemented a smart autoscaler, which monitors the size of the job queue, monitors the number of preview requests coming in, and then can scale the number of instances. So we can go from zero to 100 compiler instances in a matter of minutes. So this is what we architected. Now, did it actually work? So here are some production uh, inst metrics taken from our Prometheus cluster last week. We're doing 11,000 builds a day on average with 2.6 seconds for each individual build. And we're managing to push four preview builds a second with only six preview workers. Now, for us, this is great. This is great for average usage. Um, but these are normal numbers. What if we hit some load? So we decided to do some load testing on this. So I selected 1,000 individual of our clients to do a productionized build for. So this is doing a fully build, including uglifying, minifying, et cetera. We span up 100 workers in Mesos, it used 77 cores and 100 gig of RAM. And it did all 1,000 builds in two minutes, completely flat, all up to the CDN, with a peak throughput of nine Webpack builds a second. So this has scaled phenomenally for us. Uh, it's fantastic performance increase over our old pipeline, which would take hours to do a few hundred builds. But right now, you're probably thinking, that's, that's interesting and all, like, that's pretty cool. Um, but nobody else in this room has this problem, I can guarantee. If you do, come talk to me, it'd be very interesting. Um, so what have we learned throughout this whole process that you can take home and apply to your own builds? So the first thing we found whilst researching is something called Happy Pack. It's a great plugin for Webpack that parallelizes your loaders. So inside Webpack, when you do your first build, all of those loader runs are actually uh, in series, they don't happen at the same time. What Happy Pack does is spin up maybe four, eight instances of your Babel loader and will run your code through it all at the same time. So you can get some massive cold startup time improvements. And this may sound obvious, but sometimes you do just need to keep it simple. If you're building a project that does not need the latest bleeding edge ECMA script features, consider using Buble. It's an alternative to Babel uh, that does string manipulation instead of a full AST transform. So if you don't need all that fancy stuff, consider using that. And the same goes for React. If you're not using React's more advanced features, consider looking at Preact. We found if you put Preact and Buble together, you can get down to maybe sub 40 millisecond rebuild times. And again, on the line of keeping it simple, um, clean up after yourselves. Um, treat your code like you do your lives. You clean your living room, you clean your code. Uh, if you've installed your project from a boilerplate, go through and delete all the crap that you're not using in that config. Get rid of it. The cleaner and leaner you keep your Webpack configuration, the faster your rebuilds will be. And I, I want to quickly touch on something that has been, you know, there's been a lot of buzz about it for the last few years, um, which is tree shaking. Webpack 2 now supports it out of the box. But why has everyone not suddenly seen massive improvements by switching to Webpack 2? Well, the issue is actually with us as a community. We're not publishing our modules as ES6 modules yet. And tree shaking doesn't work on ES5 and CommonJS stuff. So we need a community shift to make it happen. So what my message is, 
Uh, don't rely on it for now, but we do need to think as a community, how can we shift into an environment that supports tree shaking? Something a little bit of an alternative uh, is roll-up. And there's one key thing that we were kind of excited about with roll-up, and it's not that it had tree shaking first, things like that. It's actually to do with closures. There have been some great articles recently on how JavaScript closures can have a real performance hit, um, especially if you start having hundreds, thousands of individual modules. Every single module you have in your Webpack build actually relates to a single closure. So having thousands of modules results in thousands of closures, which results in thousands of tiny performance hits. Rollup, on the other hand, it takes all your modules and flattens them into a single closure. So if you're struggling with performance issues due to lots of closures, check out Rollup. And the final thing I'm going to talk about today is actually what we're looking at at Qubit as the next stage of our build pipeline I'll be talking about, um, which is bundle splitting. And yeah, bundle splitting is being solved. Webpack can do it. But what we're interested in is actually prioritizing um, a kind of an entry bundle common across all of our clients that has um, a sense of priority, uh, a sense of which of these bundles, you know, we could load any of them now, but which is the most important? You know, do we prioritize data collection? Do we prioritize serving experience or personalization? Um, so this is where we're looking at at the moment, and I hope we can get some real uh, performance gains for us from there. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so is the dynamic compiler service open source? Uh, not right now. Um, the reason being is it's very much tied to our build pipeline, which has a lot of stuff kind of we had to apply that's kind of legacy support for our old stuff. Uh, what we do want to do is take some of the things we found from that, like uh, Webpack, uh, the MemoryFS instance in Webpack doesn't support modified times on files. So it can't actually make use of the Webpack internal module cache because there's no timestamp support. We're hoping to PR support back into MemoryFS, which will allow the community to get some speed gains there. So that's kind of what we're hoping to do. We're hoping to take bits of our dynamic compiler service and apply them to existing projects or release them as small open source things. How do you reuse dependencies across different builds? Uh, yes. So uh, I, I pointed out there we have a Redis cache of dependencies. This is flat. And we actually have a custom resolver in our Webpack config that knows how to read dependencies out of our flat module cache. Um, so everything is all reading um, straight off um, this Redis cache of packages. Uh, we don't cache pre-compiled because we don't need to because Redis, uh, Webpack has its own internal cache once it's compiled something. But what we do want to look into is replacing Webpack's internal cache with a Redis one so all our instances share the same um, compiled cache. Uh, what is tree shaking? Yeah, I probably should have said that, sorry. Um, tree shaking is, uh, if you imagine you have uh, a module that exports five different functions, and in your application you only use two of those functions, you don't actually need the other three to go into your build. So tree shaking is the process of shaking off all those leaves in your tree of dependencies that you don't actually use in your code base. Um, the reason it's taken a while for us to get there as a community is because we've been using CommonJS, and because you can modify the exports and do whatever you want with it, you can't statically analyze it to work out if anything's not being used. And until, as I was saying, until we do as a community push for publishing to the NPM registry um, in ES6 syntax, then we're not going to get many benefits from it. Um, considering mobile, any bundle size you suggest in kilobytes? This is a great question. Um, we do struggle with it at Qubit, um, and we have a team that's on and off dedicated to addressing file size, particularly for mobile. And our clients are getting more and more um, kind of picky about our file sizes, and they're putting it to SLAs and things. Um, our base file size is 90 kilobytes, um, and then whatever the client writes on our platform goes on top of that. We don't think that's really acceptable for mobile yet. We'd like to be much better for mobile. So we're looking into doing things like having mobile-only versions, and depending on your user agent, will serve you different versions, or using the bundle-splitting approach to serve different versions. Uh, does this kill caching? Why don't you share DLL bundles? Um, so I'm not 100% sure 
about which way you mean caching. Do you mean, if you mean browser caching, um, that's just the nature of kind of what we do and what a lot of other people do. We're updating a script on a CDN and you just have to kind of live with that. It has a short TTL um, and that's kind of something that uh, we just have to live with. Um, does the on-demand compilation happen on every page request? If you're previewing, we cache each output. Um, as I said, we cache it in Redis so that you get the, uh, the cached version. You don't have to compile every time. Um, and in production, it's served from the CDN, so it's, uh, it's not being built then. Um, and I think that's probably about it. Thank you very much.